Hello, everyone. This is the late morning program with Nam Ras, and I am so incredibly honored uh, to have His Holiness Ridananda Das Goswami, His Grace Brahma Prabhu, 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 and His and Grace Sacha Bhatta uh, Prabhu. Uh, and um, this is episode 29. Uh, and if you all saw the last episode of, of the program, there was a lot of feedback and a lot of people resonated uh, with what was being said. And of course, um, I feel that we weren't as respectful as we could have been, and we accept and we uh, acknowledge that. And I personally want to apologize uh, for saying some things that maybe weren't that respectful. But but anyways, the that podcast got us thinking, and we don't feel like this is the end of the conversation. Uh, we'd like to keep this conversation going. That's why we have everyone here today. And so I'd like to introduce uh, His Holiness Sri Ananda Maharaj, who has been practicing bhakti for the, over uh, the past 40 years. Uh, actually, he, uh, actually, actually, 51 years. 51 years. Amazing, amazing. 51 years with a PhD in Sanskrit and Indian studies from Harvard, uh, a sannyasi, a guru, an acclaimed author, and a translator of ancient Vedic scriptures, including the Srimad Bhagavatam and Mahabharat. Uh, so welcome, Maharaj. And then we have Brahmachirtha Prabhu, who is uh, a disciple of Srila Prabhupada, a professional mediator and advisor for the EPA and the director of the City of Gainesville Planning Board. Uh, his initial conversation with Srila Prabhupada were recorded and later published in a book called uh, perfect questions and perfect answers. So welcome from a Thank you. Thank you very much. Venka Debata, Vinit Chander, uh, who you all know from the past, uh, the past broadcast. Uh, he's has his Juris Doctor from George Washington University Law School. Uh, he has an MA in Religious Studies from Rutgers. Uh, he's currently a doctoral candidate at New York University. Uh, and in the past, he's been Director of Communications in North America for ISKCON. So, and, and everyone knows uh, myself, Nam Ross, I just have a bachelor's degree, I'm nothing special. <laughs> but uh, this is my program, and I'd like to kind of continue on uh, from the past um, broadcasts. And I'd like to first say, Venkata, uh, in the past broadcast, we were talking about Krishna West and, and all things like that. So let's just start out, what is your, what is your problem with Krishna West? Or what is your beef with Krishna West, we can say? Well, uh, as anyone who knows me knows, I identify very strongly as a Hindu. So the very first thing I should say is um, beef is probably not the best choice of words there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, I, I actually don't have a, a, a beef with, with Krishna West per se. Um, I There's a lot about Krishna West from what I understand, I, I, I think. Um, something that I've, I've tried to own up to from the last podcast is that um, I am not so knowledgeable about Krishna West and I, I could stand to to learn a lot more. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited about this conversation. From what I do know about Krishna West, um, there's a lot of it that really resonates with me. There's a lot of it that, um, that kind of inspires me. Um, there's a lot that I think we're in not just agreement, but in strong agreement about. So I, I really don't see it so much as, you know, I've got a problem with Krishna West or a beef with Krishna West. Um, there is, as I said, there's a lot, um, there's a lot there that, that I really appreciate and that you won't get an argument, you know, out of me um, if we're talking about, you know, the need to be innovative, if we're talking about the need to be relevant, if we're talking about um, honoring the principles uh, of and the spirit of, of what Srila Prabhupada and the previous acharyas have given us. And at the same time, I'm not going to say but, it's an, it's an and to me, and at the same time, being creative, being individuals, taking risks, um, being true to ourselves and our own inclinations and likes and dislikes. I'm 100% in agreement with all of that. Where I think um, I find certain aspects problematic or where, from what I understand um, of Krishna West, where I feel like the framework that, that Krishna West is adopting um, may be, as I said, problematic, and, and even I, I would go as far as to say that I personally take issue with, um, is in a couple of places. And so I don't want to rehash the first podcast, but if it's okay, I, I just want to share like kind of 
you know, rapid fire style. Let me just share three, try to summarize the three major areas. Um, so we're yeah, all- Is go that ahead. okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the first thing that I try to touch on in the, in the last episode of the podcast, and you know, admittedly, as conversations like that, you know, can be, we were kind of jumping around a lot. It was kind of all over the place. So let me see if I could streamline it a little bit for us now. The first concern that I have is that an effort to be innovative, as much as I love it, um, that relies so heavily on a on a dichotomy, on a on a what I perceive to be and what I've experienced to be a very rigid framework of two conceptual categories, Indian and Western, that I find problematic and I find personally alienating, right? As someone who spent most of my life and, and many of my peers, and I think Nam, you also shared some of these thoughts too, and, and we've been hearing from other folks, you know, in the, in the two weeks since the last podcast, um, for many folks who don't fit neatly into either one of those categories, a binary that sets things up rigidly using those two categories as kind of the foundation, as, as like kind of the vocabulary can feel really, not just not resonant, but can actually feel almost like, um, and I'm gonna use some strong words here, but almost like insultingly alienated, right? It's like, I don't see myself in this. Um, I don't fit into either of these categories. I don't particularly like the feeling of being pushed almost by force into one of these categories. Um, I identify with, with both and neither and all stuff in between. And so that first kind of critique is about that feeling of marginalization, that feeling of my experience, my perspective, my identity isn't really accounted for and, and therefore must not really matter to folks. Um, and while that's something that to me is very much tied into my Indian American identity, I think it also speaks to sort of um, a larger community of folks who may not necessarily feel like they can get slotted into either of those, right? So I'm talking about mixed race folks. I'm talking about um, many of my dear friends who grew up in the Hare Krishna movement, who are kind of quote unquote group bullies, who may not be ethnically Indian, but maybe who, who spent a great deal of time in India, maybe identify culturally in some ways there, and they're sort of like, well, am I Western? Am I not? So that first real critique is where are we? The, the many of us that don't see ourselves in this narrative, where are we in our perspective now? So perhaps, perhaps we could respond to that because it's a very good point. And rather than you know, lay out a lot of points, I think we go point by point. Sure. Sure. One one housekeeping thing, Maraj, before the before you respond, um, I'm I'm getting a lot of comments from my stream yard where there's 116 people watching that there is an echo. And I'm getting that comment too coming in. As well as as well as Venkata, if you can speak slower because it's being translated into Spanish. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. Sure, I'll try to keep that in mind. Or Venkata, if you speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah. You know Spanish. <laughs> If, if Venkata hadn't chosen to study French all throughout high school, he may have a very robust Spanish conversation. Okay, so can I can I humbly ask uh, if we can if we can transfer to just the Streamyard? Yeah, so there's an echo. Yeah, I, I'm getting reports of that too. Some text from people I asked to watch. Yeah, I, I made a backup plan in case that happened. And I told Ananda Leela to have it a post ready and just stick it on the Facebook and everyone will just transfer from one Facebook page to another. And then the YouTube should be impacted. Can't hear Maraj very well. Uh, that this is the this is the comments that are coming. There's the the amount of viewers on on here is going up uh, as people join. So uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you fine, but I think yeah, it might be a streamer out problem because Facebook we can hear everyone perfectly well. Yeah, uh, I'm getting it from people watching on YouTube as well as Facebook. So yeah. there's, there's viewers on both. So if we can transfer all the viewers from uh, Ridan Anamaraj's Facebook onto StreamYard, 
they'll be able, they just have to have a link. There, there's nothing else that's required. All, all they have to do is go to your Facebook page, right? No, yeah, just go to my Facebook, whoever's listening, go to my Facebook page. Uh, I can even post it here. Post it right there, and then then it will work here, fine. It's, it's tickering on the bottom of the screen, latemorning.show, and that'll take you to the Facebook page or the YouTube page and where you can watch. And comment and, or, or raise and questions. Comment, yeah. Yes, correct. So Maharaj needs to log into that because he's logged in. He's logged into both, I think, right? No, Maharaj doesn't need to do anything. All he needs to do is, is log out of his Zoom. Okay. Because he's already on the stream yard. Just log out from Zoom. And you're going to be right here. Okay, I'm going to leave the Zoom as well. Let, okay, give me just a minute and I'll log in. Here. No problem. No problem. We're, we, we, um, Nam, would it help for me to get off the Zoom call as well? Yes. Yeah, we should all get off the Zoom call and okay. stay on this one. Oh, it seems that Maharaj has left the stream yard. To all out there, we apologize for this. We got a little complicated. Hopefully that, that takes care of the echo issues and- No, that, that will definitely take care of the echo issues, but okay, Maharaj is back. I'm adding him to the stream, okay. I think we're back. Okay. Great. So should I reply to those points? Yes, yes, yes. Let's 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 continue if well, anyone is if ready. It would be, if it would be helpful, Maraj, if, if you would prefer, then maybe we can do this sort of um, rather than me try to give those three critiques. If we if we want to go point by point, if if that's what you prefer, we can definitely do that. Yeah, because otherwise I'm gonna have pages and pages of notes and uh, yeah, I think it would be nice to take that one point because also I think that our conversation about this point may affect the other points anyway. Brahmatirtha, uh... yeah, I switched uh, computers. I'm, 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 I should be okay now. You are, yes, you're okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so one second, one second, Maharaj. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, let's 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 just uh, thank you to say your your what you needed because the people are saying that they can't they don't remember what you said. So why don't you go ahead and and say that? Um. Okay. And, and I'll I'll, I'm, I'll really really try my best to be succinct here. Yeah. Please. Uh, so the the first critique that I wanted to offer and that I wanted to um, engage in some conversation around is. My experience as someone who identifies as both Indian and American, as kind of neither of those fully, as someone who feels very much in between, very much a hybrid, um, coming from my lived experience, I don't feel like I, I'm inherently suspicious of and don't see myself reflected in a framework that seems to rest on these like two very rigid categories of that which is Indian and that which is Western, that, that seems to sometimes place those as antipodes or mutually exclusive. Um, and what I, I imagine is inadvertent, and I and not even imagine. Thank you to remember to speak slowly, they're translating. Sorry about that. Knowing Hrita Ananda Maharaj, knowing Brahmacharya Prabhu, knowing many of the devotees involved um, personally, I have no doubt that the intention is very good the impact, however, is that a framework like that can can feel very marginalizing, can feel um, very dismissive of my identity, of my perspective, of my participation. And based on the feedback that I've received and that you've received, Nam, um, some of which is public and some of which was, was folks reaching out to us personally, it seems like that is resonating with other folks who feel for whatever reason, either because they're mixed race or they're Indian American or they're Gurukuli or whatever, 
that these rigid categories are don't really they, they don't really see themselves in you know, it. They're not reflective of a resi or, or resonant with their own lived experience. Right. Let's let Maharaj address that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, if Krishna West actually uh, believed or presented, as you described it, those rigid categories, and I would completely agree with you. And uh, one of the problems here is the uh, what seems to be the, the limitations of public discourse in the sense that um, we live in an age, and I, and I think this is part of it. I, I don't want to attribute too much to this, but we do live in an age in which uh, uh, the cancel culture and so that if you say, my experience has been in presenting Krishna West, that if I say something which isn't what everybody's used to hearing, that there's a tendency to assume we're saying something all the way over, all the way over there, something like, like just to give one simple example that uh, I made the point that um, if you're not a priest, like performing some ceremony on the altar in a Hare Krishna temple, and let's say you're a grihasta, then as in practically every other religion, it's not really necessary for you to wear priestly clothes if you know in order to be part of the congregation. Although in some temples uh, there there was a extreme pressure to do that. And so the, I would say the most typical response I got from people who were uh, not quite comfortable with it, and, and I got this response constantly all over the world, is do you mean that women should wear bikinis to the temple? Do you mean men should wear cut off shorts and, or, you know, sweaty t-shirts? And, 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 and so I noticed a fact of human psychology that actually when I applied to, well, anyway, never mind that. I don't want to sound demeaning. Um, I've noticed a fact of human psychology when you live in a relatively isolated, relatively closed community where everyone kind of talks a certain way, that if you say something different, uh, people tend to assume the worst, that you're saying something very extreme. And so let me give you a few counter examples to show you that my categories are not so rigid. Uh, first of all, uh, I have often praised the Indian community in America. I've often said that actually the Western devotees should follow their example. The reason that uh, Hindu immigrants to this country, to America, are perhaps the most successful immigrant community is because they're very smart and they know how to adapt. They know how to preserve what they want to preserve of their culture and at the same time adapt and be successful. And that's why, you know, they become governors or United Nations ambassadors or, you know, the heads of the biggest corporations and so on. And so I said, actually, we should follow their example. We should follow the example of the Indian community in America. So I've often made that point. Uh, another point is that uh, Krishna West is absolutely non-racial. For example, one of our senior leaders uh, comes from an Indian Hindu background, actually from Trinidad, and he's doing very, very important work. He's in, in the head of Krishna West in the UK. So Krishna West is not and has never been a racial community. It's never been that. Uh, and I've actually made that point very strongly. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons that I have not reached out to personally or worked more with the Indian diaspora in America is because my attempts to do so tended to be sabotaged. Uh, not by the Indian community. I'll, I'll, I'll give just one example. I, uh, several years ago, well, not that long, maybe like four years ago or something, four or five years ago, uh, I did a program with the Indian community uh, in a major American city. And the program was extremely successful. You know, we, we were having a great time with each other. There was real affection and we wanted to work together. And 
uh they didn't feel at all denigrated in fact i was you know it was it was a great relationship so much so that we were already figuring out different ways we could work together for example the the students from from a, from a hindu background who were at the local university could set up a student club we would do more programs and so it, it was they were so happy with the presentation that when i left i was walking out to my car, they just spontaneously followed me with a big kirtan. This is in like a you know an American big apartment <laughs> complex, and they were just they were really ecstatic. They were really you know we were all very happy. And then the next thing I knew, uh, everything was just completely uh, over, because apparently some of the gurus or, or the the main gurus for those people had contacted them and basically told them that I was you know. I don't know, toxic or just don't get involved with him. And uh, so I don't want to belabor that point, but it wasn't the only experience of the kind I had of, of you know, really reaching out sincerely and, have, and building great relationships with with uh, Hindu communities or, you know, ISKCON communities in North America and having everything sabotaged. And it's, uh, there's been a tremendous amount. I know that, um, when I first started this, that um, I don't know, is it okay to mention details or? Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. There, there is a group of, uh, uh, well, the India Bureau, it, it's the sort of uh, committee of all the leaders of ISKCON in, in, um, in India. And I remember when I first started, when I first started to do Krishna West, um, without talking to me at all, they actually issued a public <laughs> the declaration, a public declaration that I was deviant, that I had betrayed Prabhupada, that I was, uh, and, and there were a lot of things like this. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, bore your audience, but. No, but Marat, I can, I can imagine that's, that's yeah. probably so, you know, painful and hurtful that, that you had to go through that. And so, you know, for, for what it's worth, I mean, I'm like, I, I find that horrific and I'm so sorry that you had that experience. Yeah, the, in fact, there was, as far as I have to admit, to some extent, to use the, to some extent, I think I was gradually radicalized, to use that term. Because when I started out, it was all like, let's all be friends and everything. And um, and to make a long story short, not into all the, you know, the gory details, um, unless you can, I don't know if you can get Dr. Zoom here, on, uh, Dr. Phil on this, on this Zoom call, but... But um, I, uh, I start out, and Brahmacharya knows all these things, but um, there's a history of all my attempts to work things out peacefully, even with the leaders of ISKCON were sabotaged by certain leaders. I mean, whether it's coming to a happy agreement, practically in the very beginning of Krishna West, it was like very, very early. There was really very little conflict or nothing like this. And... Uh, and the Nutama Prabhu was the GBC chairman. And because there were some problems, and even those problems were due to uh, me not being allowed to respond to criticisms. And Brahman Jirtha was very well the history. But anyway, and, and again, by the way, all these things I'm saying are un, uncontested because in, in, when I went to Jane and the GBC unanimously requested me to be on the GBC body, I laid out this entire history with all the details, and there was no argument. I mean, no one said that's not what really happened. So yeah. literally months after I started Krishna West, um, I um, there was a conflict. And so Anutama, who was a GBC chairman, uh, invited me, you know, let, let's just talk. We're all old friends. So I did. I, uh, I flew to Washington, went to Potomac, and Rand Rabindra Sarup was there. And, you know, I th we were, it was very gentlemanly. We were all old friends, God brothers. And so we just sat down for a day or two and we just worked everything out. That, you know, we'll work together peacefully. No one's gonna criticize anyone else. No one's gonna get very heavy about anything. We're gonna moderate our speech. And it was done. And this was like seven years ago. What happened is that he, um, he wrote a letter to the GBC email conference saying, you know, everything's fixed. 
that HDG, you know, agreed. He's not going to say this. We're going to do that. And we're going to, it was all fixed. You know, everybody kissed and made up. What happened is there were some people, small number on the GVC that convinced everyone. And I know this from, you know, people who were there convinced the GVC, at least convinced them that, you know, maybe it was possible that I was a liar and a cheater and that therefore the GVC should not agree to anything with me because I was, you know, I was a fake. And, uh, and so the GVC did not accept the recommendation of their chairman. To give one other example, there, there was an issue where there, were, there was, I mean, sort of explain how I became personally radicalized. There was, uh, and again, Brother Chair has seen all this, he knows all the facts. Uh, I'm not making this up. Um, even before that, when I was literally, when I just started Krishna West, and there was some controversy because of some statements I make, and I'm writing a paper about that now because I take very seriously the uh, the Vaishnav system of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and hermeneutics, and I was on the hermeneutic committee, and so I, I take those things seriously because my inspiration, my whole motivation to join ISKCON was to learn a spiritual science and then teach it to others, not a sectarian religion. And so there was some objection to some of the things I'd said, I mean, unrelated to Christian West is really just about Leela or, and, and everything I said was strictly based on the Bhagavatam. But again, trying to cooperate at that point, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to debate anyone or fight with anyone. I just wanted to live in peace and just do my little program. And so uh, in order to placate, again, the GVC, and I, I thought I was being a nice guy. I think I was being a nice guy. I said that I will request Brahma Tirtha, Brahma Tirtha, who, you know, I may be a wild-eyed rebel, but he's not. He's, an, he's actually a nice person. So I have Brahma Tirtha and someone as unpolitical as Brajabi Hari Prabhu. I mean, no one has, could ever accuse him of being political. So I asked Brahma Tirtha and Rajabi Hari, two highly respected Iskand devotees, to go through all of my online media, whatever, and uh, gave them all the passwords. And I just asked them anything that you feel is too controversial or will disturb, you know, Iskand, just delete it without even checking with me. They had carte blanche. They didn't have to check with me. Just anything that they felt was controversial, they could just delete from all my media. And so they did that. And of course, it's a lot of work and they're very busy people. And 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 what happened is that they just, they missed something, you know, out of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of stuff, they just missed something, like one. And so I got a letter from the GBC chairman at that time, not a new to them, you know, saying, what about this? And I said, I explained the circumstances and they just missed that. So we'll take it out. So I got a letter back, a sarcastic letter, again, saying, basically indicating that I was a liar and a cheater. And I was trying to cheat the GBC by leaving that on. So at that point, after a few of these experiences, I began to think um, something's really wrong with this picture here. And then, of course, then, then then the India Bureau came out with an official statement they posted publicly saying that I was deviant. I, I was I had betrayed Prabhupada. And uh, then there was a very <clears throat> senior ISKCON guru in GBC, very well known, who, who gave this darshan that was posted everywhere, basically showing how I was, you know, completely mistaken about everything. And so I wrote a paper to refute that. And then another senior god brother did another thing saying how I was crazy and wrong about everything. And uh, and, and then as we started to open Little Krishna, then everybody said, well, just show that you're right. Show what you can do. So we started to open Little Krishna West centers. We didn't, I think in the history of Krishna West, we never stole one devotee from a temple. We never attacked a temple. We never, I mean, there's nothing radical about it. And then I, I, I began to get reports from many different countries that our little Krishna West centers, just these, you know, simple devotees, usually Grihastas, were being harassed, attacked, uh, vilified. You know, everybody was being warned to stay away from them. And so this is, this is, it just kept going on and on and on. And then, and then, and then another GBC chairman a few years later, 
actually, I'm very grateful for this. I thought it was a very nice gesture. Flew out uh, from Europe to Los Angeles to see me. And Vaisheshika came. Again, I mean, he's a real sadhu. I'm polemical, but he's a sadhu. So Vaisheshika came. I met with the GVC chairman and Vaisheshika. And the agreement that we reached, again, we, I mean, many times we just solved everything, many times. And every time it was sabotaged on the GVC side. So this time again, and then the GVC chairman told me the only way, and, and he was just, I mean, he wasn't against me, but he just said the only way that I can get this passed by the GVC is if we write a letter saying it's all your fault. Because the G, you know, everything has to be your fault, and you know, you will stop doing this, and now you'll do that, and the G, you know, and that's it. It's all your fault. And I said, well, I don't think so. Yeah. I have other experiences. Just to give one more, a little. I, I appreciate that, Maharaj. I really do because I think you know we all bring our histories into everything, and um, I think you're 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 being um, very gracious and diplomatic, even in, in your telling of that history. Not diplomatic, but. I think you're being as generous as, as one can imagine in your telling of that history. I think you could have, you know, um, said it in a, in a different way. Let's put it that way. Um, so I appreciate that. I, so first and foremost, I want to let you know that when when someone like myself or Nam or on this podcast, yes, we did sort of get into some snarky territory just, you know, because we're just snarky people and um, I think you and I first met years ago and 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 uh, enjoyed each other's company because we were trading some snarky, sarcastic jokes to each other. So, you know, we, we sort of we are who we are. Um, but that aside, I would personally I would I would hate I would be devastated for you to think that when I talk about my discomfort with certain aspects of Krishna West or of this, you know, framing that I'm talking about that I am in any way, shape or form, you know, coming from it, from that angle of those folks. Well, I don't think that. I, I definitely don't think that. I definitely and, and don't. One of the things that's so unfortunate and, and almost like ironic is that just as I mean, what you're describing to me, I, I'm going to I'm going to just use the word bullying. I mean, I think it's what you're describing to us sounds like like this kind of this pattern, this culture of bullying. And the irony, perhaps, um, or at least what I'm finding ironic in this moment is if you want to look at a demographic that understand that and have been on the receiving end, even within an ISKCON, of a kind of a bullying, um, I feel like we'll have we'll, we'll have a lot in common to talk about because the Indian American community, for as much as you know, we may wax lyrically about oh, ISKCON temples becoming Indianized and Hinduized, and that's actually how the first podcast kind of brought us here. For many of us, we feel like the reality behind the scenes is even in spaces where there may be numerically many, many Indian devotees, there is a culture and a pattern of marginalization, of folks feeling like second-class citizens, of, um, of Indian bashing even. And I, and, and I, I don't wanna lay the, the blame for that at the feet of Krishna West at all. Mm. And at the same time, I do want to, to just present to you that your good intentions notwithstanding, there is something that I think has been co-opted and some of the rhetoric around West and Indian and we need Westerners and Indians has perhaps been co-opted by some folks with maybe a different agenda. That's possible. And it is turning into, not just turning into, but it's, it's normalizing a pattern of Indian bashing that- okay, I, okay. I, I'd like to respond to that. Because, from the beginning of ISKCON. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Right now, the place where Krishna West is really just booming, it's like really like a Hare Krishna explosion, is in Latin America, where there are basically no Hindus. And, and so interestingly, the place where we're registering just extraordinary growth, there's no Indian issue at all, because they're, you know, just literally you can count on a hand or two, you know, how many Indians are in these countries. But but I want to address what you're saying, and, and it's, it is important. And... Uh, even as a Western devotee, I spent most of my adult life being constantly ridiculed and, you know, just because I was out on the street, a guy wearing a skirt, you know, and so especially back in the old days, if you were a Hare Krishna, so I understand completely what it's like to be always marginalized, 
even if I'm a you know Western Hare Krishna. But I think, and I can't say that it would be it would be wrong for me to say that we could not have been more clear because obviously you know perhaps we should have been more clear. But the message I've really tried to promote, and I've said this many many times, many times, is that it's not about the Indians. Because people say to me, for example, when people say to me, and this is like my this is my my standard stump speech, you know. I mean, I say this all the time. That when people like say Western people, Western devotees say to me, Well, what about the temples? You know, they're Indian, you know, and so on in the temples. What I always say is they're not the problem. They're doing everything right. They are sincere so these are the things I say constantly. They are sincere souls who have come to, to serve Krishna. Uh, they deserve to manage those temples because they have been keeping those temples going for decades. And that's why one of the principles in the very beginning of Krishna West is we're not trying to take temples back. We're not trying to change temples. We're not trying to in any way uh, get influence in any existing ISKCON temple. And people tell me that there are these temples in major American cities where it's mostly Indian congregation. I would say they deserve the temple. They've done all the work. They've paid for everything. They're sincere souls. They're doing everything right. The problem is the Western devotees that we're not preaching to Western people. And, 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 and that's been the message I've, I've really tried to get across. Mar Maraj, I, I, I so much appreciate the recognition of, of what folks have been doing right, and particularly first generation Indian American devotees, congregations. Where I'm, where I'm having a hard time, just to be very frank with you, is even in what you just said, we're again assuming this kind of like easy dichotomy between the Western devotees reaching out to Westerners and the Indian devotees reaching out to Indians. Uh, but that's not our position. Sounding like a separate but equal no, kind. No, of but, but that, that's not our position. So first so of all, our yeah, fire, that's what I'm hearing and feeling. No, okay, okay, that I respect that, but I am just going to keep trying to say what 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 our real position is. First of all, I think we should not fall into an extremely common fallacy nowadays in which the, the, it's a fallacy that uh, valid generalizations are somehow invalid because there are exceptions. I mean, the fact is that, let's say if, if a typical Western people, if a typical Western person goes into a typical ISKCON temple, with let's say a largely Indian congregation, Indian diaspora. The fact that there are cultural Barriers. difficulties mm -hmm. is, is obviously true. Now you are, and I would say myself, and, and you know, coming from a different direction, because for example, I obviously, you know, have a Western body. No one's really Western or Indian, but I have Western body. But at the same time, my great love from the beginning of my spiritual life was Sanskrit and the, and the Vedic literatures and trying to understand it. I, I think Western culture or modern culture, I'd say in many ways, is just barbarism. And uh, so, I mean, I mean, you are in the middle. You are a hybrid, as you said. And to say that, in other words, it's undeniable that there is such a thing as Indian culture. And that if you go to our temples, there are many, many things, even temples, let's say, where there are no Indians, where it's just all Westerners. And, and, and where it's, and even a type of, um, and again, this is not about uh, people from India, either diaspora or still there. It's not about them. And I've really tried to make that clear. It's not about them. It's not that they're doing something wrong. But the fact that people have different cultural comfort zones, whether it's food, whether it's dress, whether it's architecture, music style, it's just, it's real. It's real. And, and, um, and so, and I've all, another thing that I've said constantly is it's not that one is better than the other. It's, you know, not, not talking about, let's say, the real Krishna conscious culture, which obviously is superior. We're talking about ethnicity. I've said constantly, Western culture, and no, it, you know, it's not better. I'm not saying it's better. 
I'm not saying you're a better devotee. I'm just, we're just talking about making people comfortable. And I would be thrilled. I would be absolutely thrilled beyond words if significant numbers of Indian Americans or Indian Indians or anyone would come and help and join. I mean, I would be perfectly happy if, if we had, you know, to have lots of Indian American leaders in Krishna West. We already have the person who's, who's in charge of the UK. I'd be completely happy with that. This is not about race. It, it's just about getting the job done. So if like, uh, so, so anyone that wants to come and just help us be a leader, you know, you're most welcome. So it's, if, I, if one, last, one last point, I keep, sure, forgetting, sure. I keep forgetting to say it. And, uh, or I, but I, I, I underlined it about five times. Go ahead, yeah. And that is, if, if people listen carefully to what I'm saying, which usually critics don't. But if people listen carefully, it's not even about Indian culture. Because I'm very much aware of what's going on in India, you know, the shopping malls and the India's Got Talent and the, I understand the, the all the homogenizing, westernizing forces in contemporary history. And actually I have a very good friend who is uh, a leader in another spiritual organization, but they follow the same principles we do. It's not a Vaishnava organization. And uh, this friend tells me, this person's from India originally, and uh, very smart, PhD, and uh, living in America, kind of very westernized, although grew up in Hyderabad. And this person right now is totally into all these amazing things that are going on in India in terms of the younger generations, you know, who are tech savvy and who are starting to take down all these mafias in India, whether it's the mafia in Bollywood or, or you know, the mafia in the media. And, and, and so India is, I mean, amazing things are going on in India right now, not only in the sense of wearing blue jeans or, you know, India's got talent, but in much more significant ways. And that is kind of like buying into the whole Western rationalist idea and and the idea of i mean which ideas which in a sense go back to ancient indian history another point i make you see there's all kinds of things i say all the time that for example how india was thousands of years ahead of the west you know wh whether you talk about the greek ambassador megasthenes who, who was an ambassador in india almost two and a half thousand years ago describes india as a country which is obviously significantly advanced beyond anything in other parts of the world. I mean, it's it, w whether it was the fact you force there are no slaves in India, that non-combatants are never in danger in warfare, they have animal hospitals, they have special ministries just to protect uh, foreigners from being exploited by the local people, uh, the vegetarianism. India, without question, I mean, this is a point I made in, when, when I taught the history of India. And these are points I always make, that if you look at, let's say, the last thousand years in Indian history, especially, let's say, during the 700 years of, of Muslim rule, and you look at how Muslim rulers treated Hindus and how Hindu rulers treated Muslim, Muslim I mean, with some exceptions, it's just, it's just this radical difference. It's a radical difference that India was just... The Hindu population was so much more cultured, so much more open, so much more freedom. The, the fact that in the Mahabharata, there's freedom of speech. You can criticize the government. There's a, I mean, in, in many ways, I'd explain this. And so the point I want to make here is that um, I'm not really talking about Indian culture when I make my critique. If you listen to what I'm actually saying, what I'm talking about is what I call the myth of Vedic culture. It, it's, it's, it's the myth which has no scriptural basis, no historical basis, uh, that somehow in ISKCON and presenting itself through Hindu, Hindu Muslim culture, because that's what it is, the dress, the food, the, uh, the music, half of it comes from the Muslims and half of it comes from the Hindus, even if you look linguistically at Hindi. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not arguing that point at all. I mean, and, and so what I'm saying is that presenting Hindu Muslim culture as somehow sacred Vedic culture and therefore something which has special religious significance, that's what, what I'm really targeting, not contemporary Indian culture. Yeah. 
I, I, I appreciate that. I like that clarification that that helps. Um, and I, I don't want to like, you know, I don't want to hijack this, but <laughs> could we, could we even, could we not even go one step farther? So maybe I'm, maybe like, this is going to be the only critique type of conversation. I want you to go farther. I don't know. Maybe I want you to be even more radical. Um, but could we not go one step further and say, even that kind of bizarre privileging of a mythic sort of, you know, Vedic Indian superiority that we see in ISKCON, even that, might that not be a symptom of a larger, deeper cultural dysfunction? Might that not itself be a symptom of something deeper and more problematic as far as ISKCON culture? And maybe that's what we should be addressing. And that's, and, and, you know, and I hope we can go there. Um, but that's I'd like to really, I'd, I'd like our conversation to go because to be honest with you, Maharaj, to be perfectly honest with you, and, and I, I tried to make this point with the, 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 the Simpsons analogy. I don't know if you heard that. I don't know if you're a Simpsons fan, but this, this is the whole Malibu Stacy in a hat thing. My issue with Krishna West or even with the framing, um, even if it's a little jarring to my ears, my major issue with it is not so much, I think you are bashing on Indians or you know, Indian people. And my issue with it is there's so much potential. I'm so excited about the idea to be just perfectly candid with you. I'm so inspired by and excited by the prospect of naming and uprooting dysfunctional culture that has held devotional communities back and then I'm so profoundly disappointed, if I can be honest, and this is not a dig at you, but this is just my honest feeling. I'm so profoundly disappointed when it, when it feels like that conversation, rather than going into those places and looking at what are some of the root causes, when those conversations seem to become overstated and over fixated even on Indian dress and Western dress, Indian food, Western food, Indian X, Western X. Right? Oh, 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 I, I'd like to give I, I'd like to give Brahmatir the Prabhu a chance if if he wants to add something or to respond. Sure. Well, um, there's a few interesting points. I'm reading here. There's many many interesting questions on the comment thing. So right, I hope right. We have there's, time to get to it. Flood I thought very astute in. questions and very very relevant. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm listening carefully to all of this. I, I, um, I, I'm putting aside sometimes some dysfunction that has occurred in ISKCON. And what happened, ISKCON is generally a very conservative organization. And when any uh, of, of the sacred pillars are challenged, there's visceral reactions. Arupa Goswami has made the point of details and principles of devotional service. Obviously, a dhoti is a detail, and what you're having for lunch is a detail. It's not a principle. It's various time, place, circumstances. I think we all know that. But all of us, me too, get mixed up on these points and sometimes cling to a detail as a, as a sedantic principle. And they're not. They're a detail that very circumstantial, and we have uh, many examples from Prabhupada uh, backing it up. Examples from Bhakti Siddhanta backing it up. Uh, and both, uh, by the way, uh, Prabhupada and Bhakti Siddhanta were both strongly criticized for dealing with the modernity, and uh, so that's some of where this comes from. So I understand it, it's healthy that Iskan is fairly conservative because it makes change hard. You don't want to, Prabhupada gave us two paradoxical instructions. Don't change anything and adjust to time, place, and circumstances. Right. Now think about that one for a minute. They're extremely paradoxical. And in reality, we must do both. And, and, and so uh, the conservative element of ISKCON prevents too much change and the liberal element prevents too much stasis because stasis means we become irrelevant. One thing I mentioned to you before the show, Namras, I like about your show, especially like about it, is you're not at all shy about 
relevancy. Thank you. You go for it. So, so I'm just trying to put this discussion in in a context. Now, uh, just finally, the first preacher in America to take a regular ISKCON temple and make it a predominantly Indian population. I know who did that. Me. I was in Houston. Um, I was one of the rare people with an outside job. I spoke enough Hindi. The first diaspora from India that could get visas were the engineers, <laughs> not the shopkeepers. So they congregated in the oil industry of Houston. Every day at work, I'd go down to this plaza and just be surrounded by Indians preaching. And everyone in those temple days, it's the 70s, everyone had to do Sankirtan whenever you weren't. I was a weirdo. I had an outside job. Well, I wasn't much of a Sankirtan, so I found my niche. And it worked. And it worked very well. And so I started bringing the Indians into the into the temple and becoming friends with them. And they started becoming serious, serious devotees, not, uh, 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 not relating uh, as uh, Vaishnavs above anything else. Um, but it became too much of a thing such that um, Westerners would find it, uh, for example, the prashadam was so spicy that it would burn people's guts out and people didn't want to come. So Tamal Krishnamaraj, in the very last lecture he gave in Houston, a very, very good lecture, I just recently listened to it again, said, uh, Prabhupada's mission, um, uh, and we say it in his pranam man mantra, Paschata Desitarne, is to go to the Western world. He said, you Indians, you're one step. Prabhupada said Indians are one step from Krishna when he was here, facing the wrong way. And Americans are 10 steps facing the right way. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj's message was, hey, let's just work together. Not Indians, not Americans, but we have a mission to deliver the Western world. That's Prabhupada's mantra. So let's get more serious about delivering the Western world than making our temple into a place where we can do a lot of stick dances because you're comfortable that way. So that was kind of the challenge. I'm the first one to really go down that route. Then historically, um, uh, the Indian community, which is very pious, they understand Krishna right away, as Prabhupada said, one step away. And they started giving a lot of Lakshmi to ISKCON. They still do. I still, projects I do, uh, a lot of my biggest donors are, are usually Indian donors. They're, they're part of the family, but they're supporting a mission to Pashtata, Desata, they present Christian conscious to the Western world. So how to balance these two things? I'm very sensitive what Venkata says, that um, it's very easy to step over a line and, you know, and stereotype a group such as Indians or a particular Indian sub-ethnicity of which there are unlimited. It's very easy to do that. And it's very dangerous because Prabhupada would so many times say, I'm not Russian, I'm not American, I'm not Gujarati, I'm not Bengali. So to rise above these things in a unified way to present Krishna, it's a real challenge for us. That's why this dialogue today is so important. And with that, I said too much. No, no, no. no. Thank you. Okay, so Mar Maraj, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to reply to something that Venkata said. Sure. I'm enjoying this. Um, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, we're having a good time. <laughs> uh thank you brahmatir that very well said um and i agree with everything you said i would say to venkata that um there's another very important dimension i would say in me it's like you know those little kitty books like what makes johnny run and so there's another very powerful motivation within me that, that i should you know state publicly And that is that, um, unfortunately, and I'm actually very sorry about this, that as far as I know, I'm the last active preacher in ISKCON that was trained by Prabhupada directly as a Western GBC. And um, so what you said, Venkata, that 
I mean, I would say intellectually, we pro probably agree on everything. I'm, I mean, I can't think of anything based on what you said that I'm just on an intellectual level that I disagree with you on. At the same time, uh, Prabhupada, one time I was alone with him in his room in Caracas, where I was hosting him in, in Latin America. And he would just sometimes say things to me that not that I asked him. And, and so Prabhupada obviously was thinking deeply about something. And he said, sometimes when a preacher goes out to preach, he has to, he acts on the Kshatriya platform. And I think Prabhupada was thinking about his own behavior, you know, very heavy statements. We know how heavy Prabhupada could be. And so, um, having been trained by Prabhupada, uh, the present state of the movement in the Western world, and I'm not blaming anyone, it's, it's just historical reality. The present state of the movement, I have absolutely no doubt would, if Prabhupada, let's say, came back, he would be shocked, he would be incredulous. And I know exactly what he would do, because he did it so many times when he was here with us. He would call all the senior leaders, including myself, he, he would order us to come immediately wherever he was, and we would sit down with him, and this actually happened many times with Prabhupada, we would sit down with him, and basically in his own way, he would say, what the hell is going on? And how are you gonna fix this? If you listen to Prabhupada, and again, this is absolutely not against Indians, Indian Americans, it has nothing to do with them. I don't see them as part of the problem. In fact, I've praised them. They, they're serving Krishna. They, they support our temples. They're great souls. I always say this. They're part of our family. We're all one family. I always say that. This is not about the Indians. It's about the fact that from the point of view of any seriously trained historian, ISKCON is in a major historical crisis, which involves a very, very heavy existential threat to the mission. Because if you project the current trends of where ISKCON is going, if you project this out in historical time, it's basically the end of the ISKCON as Prabhupada knew it and as Prabhupada created it. And, and so to me, it's it's a crisis. It's like one of those you know movies. I don't know you know Bruce Willis or Tom Cruise where you know the Earth is going to blow up in in seventy two hours unless somebody does something. I mean, it, to me, it's an all out existential threat to Prabhupada's mission, and I'm basing this on Prabhupada's repeated personal instructions, teachings to me, the way he trained me, and so in answer to what to something you brought up. Uh, several years before I started uh, Krishna West, I was still, you know, my, you know, the shelf life for my PTSD wasn't over yet in terms of what I'd gone through in ISKCON. And so I would became interested in this general topic of, you know, what is Vedic, what is not Vedic, what is, and, and I had absolutely no intention of ever again becoming a public leader in ISKCON based on the experience I'd had. And so it was sort of a purely intellectual thing. I just sort of, you know, we all join the movement because we care about truth or according to Krishna, the four kinds of people approach him. One kind is people that really care about the truth. They want to get it right. And so sort of in that spirit, as a truth lover, I, I raised a question, which was, what is Vedic? And it was kind of, a, it was sort of like an intellectual movement Again, I had no intention of ever creating a community or working. I just didn't want to have anything to do with that. It was just intellectual. And a lot of people were interested, but in terms of helping ISKCON to escape this existential threat, it did absolutely nothing. It did absolutely nothing. Maharaj, can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on the existential threat? Yes. Yeah, Prabhupada... Uh, immortalized in his Pranam Mantra, which he wrote. There was no one else to do it. If you look at Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra and analyze it, you know, it's, four, it's a sloka, which means four lines of eight syllables, roughly. And um, so the first line, Prabhupada simply 
identifies himself, explains who he is. Namaste Saraswati Devi, I'm a disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta. And then the next line, uh, he explains what he's doing in general. Uh, Gauravani Pracharine, preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya. And then the next two lines, which are half of his entire Pranam Mantra, he explains what his special mission is. Because when Prabhupada wrote that, let's say in the, uh, the late 60s, or uh, when Prabhupada wrote that, that mantra, or very early 70s, um, there were many people living in the world who fit the first two categories. There were many people who were disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta and who were preaching Lord Chaitanya's message. So the first two lines identify Prabhupada, they locate him historically, but they don't say anything special about him. The next two lines explain who Prabhupada is personally. And that is, he's nirvishesha shunyavadi paschatya desha tarini. He's the savior of the Western countries. And if you remember, like in, in, in the fourth canto, where Prithu, uh, uh, all the Brahmins are praising him when he's coronated, and he says, well, wait till I do it. And so, um, to me, it's a question of Prabhupada's honor. It's a question of saving the planet. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada had two kinds of strategies. One was just more as a loving spiritual father. It's like, okay, everybody go out, whether you go to Fiji or to London or to Philadelphia or to, you know, Buenos Aires, wherever you go, your service is very important. Just pr Prabhupada, a loving spiritual father, encouraging all the kids that, you know, your service is very important. So you'll, you'll find letters like that and statements like that. But then Prabhupada had an explicit global strategy which he personally, you know, preached to me many times, personally, privately, talked to me about. And that is that his entire mission, as he envisioned it, of saving this planet, depended on the movement being very successful in the Western world with Western people. And that was his, that was his strategy. That was Prabhupada's global strategy. And so if that fails, and it, it kind of is, I mean, there's some really excellent Western preaching programs. There are many excellent Western devotees. There are many excellent Indian American devotees. They're great souls. I'm sure they're going back to Godhead. But as a historian, as a someone trained by Prabhupada in, in very hard nose, practical terms. Like I would like, like I, I get this ethereal question from many devotees. Well, what do you mean success? Okay, I'll tell you what I mean. I mean, walking into Prabhupada's room, offering obeisances. And as soon as I sit up, he says to me, how many books did you just have been distributed? How many temples? How many new, new devotees? I mean, obviously the quality has to be there, obviously. But assuming the quality is there, it is all about numbers. In, in terms of saving the planet. It's like there's fires now in California. You just need a certain number of firemen. So, so, so there, there is an objective fact of the matter. And so judging in that sense, it seems to me as a historian and, and other historians, you know, practically every neutral historian, not anti-ISKCON, but every neutral academic historian agrees with this. In fact, that ISKCON's not making it. In fact, ISKCON is given in, in anthologies about new religious movements as an example of a movement that kind of had what it takes to become very successful in the West, but failed because of their inability to adequately adapt to their host culture. So when I say that ISKCON is not making it in terms of fulfilling Prabhupada's vision, here's another point. This is very hard-nosed, uh, very, very hard-nosed analysis. It's not racist. It's not ethnicist. It's not anti-Indian. It's purely strategic. That's all it is. Marge, can I can I allow uh, Venkata to, yeah, to yeah, yeah, let, respond? Let, let, let Marge finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, you can finish. Sorry. I'll, I'll, wrap, I'll wrap it up. Not now. Let's see, what was I going to say? Um, it's not racist. It's not ethnicist. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it's just completely hard nosed, strategic, and and that is right now. 
because Prabhupada started in America and the West, still a lot of the most senior, uh, a lot of the most senior um, ISKCON gurus, probably the majority of them, are still Western. And uh, that makes a big difference, I think. Mark, when you say Western, just to, just to clarify, not to pick on you, but just to clarify, you mean from like a, a European heritage background? Is that what you yeah, mean? European American background. Like right. based in America. Or, or just that's where they were born, that's where they grew up. Got it, okay. Yeah. And so uh, in the near future, I'm, I'm sure in your lifetime, maybe not in mine, uh, that will not be the fact. And so as a historian, as a trained historian, I monitor, for example, every year I get, okay, here are the GBC resolutions for this year. And one of the items is sannyas candidates, guru candidates, and overwhelmingly, uh, it, it's not from the West. And, 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 so what you, and so if you just project these very simple mathematical vectors, if you just project them, what we're looking at is probably, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure you live a long life, but uh, within your lifetime, ISKCON uh, really becoming very much an Indian movement with some little branches in the West and perhaps more significant centers in Eastern Europe. And if you follow contemporary history, you know that there, that, that for example, Russia really isn't a Western country. And so, uh, so I, and then if you look at, if you look at other new religious movements, for example, the Yogi Bhajan movement, which was completely taken over, and I'm not using the word taken over for ISKCON, I'm picking my words carefully, but the Yogi Bhajan movement was completely taken over by, by ethnic Sikhs. And um, so I think that once that happens, that you know, the, the, the major gurus in ISKCON, the sannyasis, the leaders, the temple presidents uh, are, are basically from an Indian background. I think that ISKCON will become less, not more capable of really establishing a powerful mainstream Western movement. Last thing, and then I'll, then I'll, I'll turn it over. I think that uh, I would never criticize someone because I, I you know, I'm not a, a, a slave to sort of political correctness. I would never criticize someone because they're comfortable in their own culture. I am. It doesn't mean I think it's better. It doesn't mean I don't love and appreciate and, and you know, other people. You know, I have lots of friends all over the world. But there are cultural comfort zones and, 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 and you can tell people you shouldn't be that way, but most people are that way. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're racist. It doesn't mean they're this. It doesn't mean they're that. It's just, it's just sort of a natural, we're wired that way neurologically. And so, and, and like I said, if anyone wants to help Krishna West, I couldn't care less what kind of body they have. It, it's like, for example, in, in Latin America, Krishna West has taken the lead and taken a lot of flack also because of that in fighting for uh, proper treatment of women in a very chauvinist part of the world. You know, like like there's kind of like this Latino, you know, male thing, you know, the macho. The word macho is a Spanish word. You know, there are many excellent devotees in Latin America, a lot of very intelligent devotees but the culture is a bit more macho than North America. That's just a fact. And so Krishna West has, has taken the lead and has taken a lot of flack because we are fighting to, to protect women, you know, you know, you know against sort of this uh, a, a culture which sometimes is abusive towards women. Yeah. And, and so we're the last people in the world to care what kind of body you have. Well, I, you know, I. That's I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Unfortunately, that's not a story. That's not, you know, for whatever reason, and perhaps there are nefarious sort of sabotaging, you know, saboteurs at work. <laughs> that narrative, but that's not the narrative of Krishna West that, that you often hear, right? Um, I don't hear a lot about efforts to combat misogyny, for instance, right? So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. May I just, may I respond to a couple of sure. the things? Um, and, and, and also Brahmacharya Prabhu. 
Um, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I respond also knowing that I am now, you know, I just want to like state like full disclosure. I realize that I am necessarily treading into very tricky waters um, and I don't want to overstep. So I'm going to ask you both for permission to, 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 to share my own reflections and realizations on um, Prabhupada's mission and, and what Prabhupada might, how Prabhupada might respond to our current context. If that's okay, I know that I haven't had that lived experience. So please, we're here to. Hear this is you. this is nephews and uncles talking at the dinner table. This is, nep- this is, like, this is why we're here, Venkita. Uncle, go for it. Go okay. ahead, Venkita. Go ahead. Uncle BT, can I can I go there a little bit? Of course, <laughs> go there. You must. <laughs> so I, again, so much of of what you both have said really resonates. Um, not to be overly simplistic or kind of cutesy about it, but I think if we wanted to use that, like kind of standard, um, you know, Indic typology or, or, you know, wherever of like Sambandha, Abhidea and Prayojana. I think on the level of Sambandha, we're probably pretty close to one another. We, there may be some little tweaking here and there or different opinion, but on the level of sort of Sambandha of where we're at, what's going on, I'm not gonna argue much. I, I think, you know, you use strong language and I think that strong language is warranted. And when you talk about an existential crisis, it's painful to hear. It's embarrassing to hear. It's um, I would much rather emotionally not deal with it and not think about it. But I, I have to agree. There is a kind of an, ex- an existential crisis. There is a kind of a, a real fear of um, something being fundamentally lost. And, and I think lost potential is, is just tragic. Um, I can only imagine what it feels like from your perspective, having lived through mm. you know, direct guidance from Prabhupada and to now be in this situation is heartbreaking. Um, so I can I can only imagine. So so on that level of sort of some bunda of where we're at as far as problems, I don't think we're so far off. I think temples, and, and I'm gar- going to largely speak from the North American context because that's a, I, I don't travel nearly as much as I imagine either of you do. Um, so... I can only really speak to the North American context somewhat, not even authoritatively, but at least somewhat um, experientially. In the context of North America, I do think that it is problematic when you have temples that feel and that perhaps are ethnically homogenous, ethnically and racially, culturally, if we want to use that loaded term, monochromatic, right? That that doesn't sit well with me. I don't. I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem whether it's in you know New Jersey, and I'm not picking on New Jersey, but whether it's in New Jersey or whether it's in Kansas or whether it's in LA or wherever it is. Um, so wh- if we want to call that the sort of the sambanda, gyan kind of the sambanda arena, I don't think we're we're going to differ too much. Where I think we may differ a little bit, at least in terms of the the semantics around it is on the Prayojana, but maybe not that much. Because I think, and um, my own a realization is a lofty word, but my own sort of where I'm at um, is that the Prayojana, the, the, the goal that would really put a smile on Srila Prabhupada's face, um, based on what I know of what he experienced and, and what he d- demonstrated from 1965 to 1977, and then trying to project that into our current situation is a vibrant, diverse, loving community of of, of Vaishnavas that is attractive and that retains. So that attracts thoughtful people in the West, everywhere in the world, but particularly to your point about Prabhupada's special mission being the first one to, in this powerful way, bring Krishna Bhakti outside of the boundaries of India. Um, to me, the way that I feel inspired to, to, to sort of conceptualize that Prayojana is a vibrant, diverse community of, of, of Vaishnavas worldwide and, and in the West, particularly. Where I think we might really disagree, I could be wrong, but I think where we might really disagree is on that level of Abhideya, on that level of what is the, the best means to get there. While I think it's tempting, and I and and again, this is not 
this is not a put down. But while I think it's tempting to frame that in terms of Indian culture and Western culture, while I think there's some value in maybe that being a part of the discourse, to me, the more meaningful discourse that's possible is if we don't use that kind of framing and instead we use other framing. So for instance, Maraj, you, you mentioned early on in our conversation, you mentioned this kind of dynamic of um, sort of liturgical clothes, or like, I think you called it like priestly clothes. I think we can have the same or a similar conversation about the effects, the relevance, the barriers of wearing particular clothing. We can have that same conversation without making it a matter of Indian clothes and by extension, Indian people wearing Indian clothes and feeling comfortable doing that, which may or may not be true. Um, I mean, not to make this about me, but I, for instance, um, made a decision when I started my work at Princeton as a Hindu chaplain that I thought about what it might communicate to wear more traditional, you know, Indian or ethnic attire. Um, and I realized that for me, where I feel most comfortable, where I feel, feel most in my own skin and, and able to be authentic was to be dressed kind of like I'm, I'm dressed now, maybe a little bit nicer in the pre-COVID days where people would actually see your whole body and your whole wardrobe and judge you. Um, for me, you know, that, that feels right to me. For me, it, it's not a matter of is this Indian clothing or is this Western clothing? And based on that, based on those um, qualifiers, let's have a conversation about what's relevant and what works. But what makes a lot of sense to me, and I think you said this really well, Maraj, is this is clothing that for whatever historical and sociological reasons has been aligned with identification as a priest or a monastic even, right? This is liturgical clothing. This is priestly clothing. These are robes. I mean, I think it's interesting that um, in, in sort of the common kind of collective understanding of what Hare Krishna devotees were wearing out when you were wearing your skirt on the street, Maharaj. Um, I think most, you know, average Americans, if you were to ask them, they probably would not be familiar with terms like dhoti uh, or chadar, but they would probably call them robes if they were being kind of kind about it, right? Um, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's because in the collective consciousness, that type of clothing evokes this idea of being a full-time monastic and monastics wear robes. I've heard you, Maharaj, speak um, so, you know, so so lucidly about every culture carving out space for the holy man. And do, do you recall saying that, Maharaj? Yes, this idea yeah. of like that, that every culture recognizes that there is space for the holy man and the holy man or holy woman, holy person, um, generally wears clothing that somehow reflects that not always, but but very often. That to me is a, a much more meaningful, um, constructive conversation. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that in the early years of the movement, as, as I understand, but you both lived through, in the early years of the movement, there was almost an imperative for some maybe good reasons, some maybe not so great reasons, but there was almost an imperative for everyone, whether brahmachari, grahasta, sannyas, or whatever, to present themselves and to maybe even inhabit the space of we are full-time monastics, even, even married folks. And correct me if I'm wrong, Brahmachandra Prabhu, but even married folks, there was a lot of pressure, right? You were married in name, but your lifestyle was a lifestyle of a full-time ashramite. Definitely. I think it's a very different place than we're in now. I don't think it's a bad thing that it's a very different place that we're in now. I think there's huge potential to um, for 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 us to relate to for all of us to relate to people in a much more meaningful, authentic way as people who are not cloistered ashramites, but as people who are living and working and engaging in the same world that everyone else is. But we're also sadhikas and we're also practitioners. You know, we, well, same thing. We're sadhikas. We're practitioners of this this path of bhakti. Um, that's the kind of conversation I want to have. That's where I'd like to see our Abhideya going. And where I, if, if, if I come off as a kind of a, um, a whiny complainer or, or a critiquer, it is mainly in that space of why is a conversation so much 
Indian clothes, Western clothes, Indian diet, Western diet. Again, to the point of food, I agree with you, Brahmacharya Prabhu, spicy food generally is not, it, there's a small, maybe there's a small segment of the population that's going to be like, bring it on. I love, I love to have my taste buds, you know, like <laughs> burned to a crisp, right? Some, there's no accounting for taste. Some, some, some people may really be into that. The, the, the sort of, if you're thinking what is going to be most comfortable, most accessible, I like the word accessible, if we can use that word, I, you know, I think that might be a useful or constructive way of looking at it. What is going to be most accessible to the most number of people? That is going to be food that is well-prepared, that is healthy, that is fresh, that is increasingly, I think people are thoughtful, people are realizing that it should probably be local and seasonal rather than, you know, canned and preserved and shipped in from God knows where, right? Um, that is going to be, hopefully, that is going to minimize harm and violence. So whether that means moving more and more towards a, 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 an authentically ahimsa diet, right? All of this kind of stuff, that to me is what it means to thoughtfully think about what kind of food is accessible to people. That is a constructive conversation about what is accessible and what is inaccessible to people. That to me is more, and I, I realize I'm, I'm intentionally caricaturing the, the Krishna West position here. So forgive me, I, I realize that's not what you're saying. But for folks maybe who, who aren't part of Krishna West, but who are distilling mm -hmm. this conversation about what is accessible, what is meaningful, what is relevant into, therefore, let's chuck out Indian food Let's get on board with, you know, spaghetti and wheat balls or whatever, right? Um, that to me is it, it's it's a it's a damn shame because it's it's a it's it's a it's 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 such a surface surface level sort of um, and, and forgive me, I, I'm not directing this towards either of you or even towards Krishna West as an organization, but to folks who are who are who are taking who are walking away and and making everything about you know, let's reject the Indian version of, of XYZ and let's uphold, you know, the Western version of XYZ. It's like, it, it's almost like the get rich quick scheme version of the constructive conversation around accessibility and relevance that needs to happen. If, if I if I could bring up a point to respond to you, uh, and thank you for your points there. Uh, um, there's several things I wanted to say. One is that, um, I, first of all, I agree with you that, that that's where the conversation should go. So I, I, you know, I'm happy and comfortable with, with where you think we should be going. I think, though, that we, we should not have historical amnesia. One thing is that when I started Krishna West, um, the first year or two, I was flooded with letters, you know, email from all over the world, people telling these horror stories about how they were stigmatized, uh, humiliated, all kinds of things because they didn't want to wear a dhoti or a sari. It, and, and so you, I mean, I mean, the oh. area you, Marge, did they tell you why they were stigmatized? Did they tell yeah. you? Yeah, exactly. Because they, they they wanted to come to the temple just wearing, you know, decent, decent Western clothes. Mm. Right. No, but my point, Marge, is is did whoever was doing the stigmatizing, the bullying, right. the right. banning, right. and whatever else you know they were doing, what was their rationale for doing it? Was it? Oh, the rationale was exactly exactly what you just uh, rejected, and, and me too, and that is that there is th this overwhelming narrative which i think now has 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 not so much because of a lot of the teaching we're doing but that let me give you one example this this really happened like about two years ago i was in uh australia and a well-known iskon guru sannyasi nice guy I guess in other ways, uh, happened to be in the same area I was. And so he came over to see me and we had a talk and he got very angry because I was disagreeing with him. Maybe he thought I was getting very angry because anyway, he disagreed with me, but whatever it was, um, 
And he was insisting, adamantly, like angrily insisting that in the Bhagavatam, it's clearly said that India, the external culture of India, the external culture of India is a reflection of the spiritual world. He even gave me the word pratibimba, which, uh, which in Sanskrit literally means counter image or reflection, pratibimba. Bimba, Pratibimba, image and counter image. And, and he was adamant and he was angry about it and stormed off. So I looked it up. And of course, of course, it's all completely wrong. I mean, there is no such statement anywhere in the Bhagavatam. The word Pratibimba is in the Bhagavatam, but used in completely different ways. And, and I thought, here's a person traveling around the world, thousands of devotees sitting at his feet and, and you know, and, and giving this narrative. And, and, and so the idea that... Uh, I mean, and again, this is not about Indians. This really is not about Indians. It's about uh, it's about the Western population, certain percentage, who uh, I mean, if I can, I mean, a word I've used, maybe it's harsh or maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said it, but I tend to call them, you know, well, the Indian chauvinists. Yeah. No, I, right. And, and, and so, for example, there'll be there will be a like I say a namahata just to get together with this con devotees in some part of the world, say in the West. And so they they won't even if the devotee doesn't wear a a, a um, let's say a dhoti or sorry, but some kind of Indian clothes like like those shirts that go down to your knees and everything. And 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 so it's just there. I I think it, it's it's very difficult to overestimate. Again, I got I was flooded with mail from people telling their stories of how they were stigmatized, humiliated, how they were, you know, told you can't come to the temple or you can't have devotional service simply because they didn't want to dody up. And 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 so, you know, you've lived, as far as I know, you know, your devotional life in an area which is kind of like it's been one of the more thoughtful, you know, Ravindra Srup is there, Nutra is more of a liberal, thoughtful part of ISKCON. But you go out in the ISKCON hinterland, you know, you go here and there. I mean, I've had many devotees tell me that they were, you know, devotees. I had a temple president in Europe come to me and he was livid. He was like, I mean, literally, he was so angry. He was spitting as he spoke. I mean, he was that angry. And the reason he was so angry is because a senior devotee who would travel with me to that ISKCON project had led a kirtan for Guru Puja and uh, wasn't wearing a dhoti. I mean, he was dressed very nicely, like a gentleman. He was you know, dressed very nicely, but he, he didn't wear a dhoti. And this temple president was beside himself with rage. And, and, and so, plus, you know, the idea that, again, the idea that I don't think I introduced this kind of language into the discourse. Maybe my failing, I mean, I maybe someday I'll learn to see it that way. I don't quite see it that way now, but perhaps it was my failing that I didn't sort of radically change the discourse. But I kind of, but but when I started Krishna West, that was absolutely a, a, a very, very heavy teaching all over the world, not everywhere, but throughout the world that you know th there's a divine culture in india the, the the you know the present culture of india ethnic e ethnicity i'm talking about not shastra not you know great acharyas and things for example the choli which comes from the ancient dynasty of chola it's just a it's just a chola blouse called a choli but uh, you see it in iskhan art you see radharani you know wearing indian clothes and that's what they are they're not vedic there's no such thing. They're not faded clothes. There and 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 you know so, but this idea that which a sannyasi, a leading Western sannyasi and guru, not an Indian, right? Although I did, for example, during the same trip to Australia, I met another prominent ISKCON sannyasi who is from India actually, and has a prominent position preaching in ISKCON, and. Um, we, we, you know, I invited him for lunch and he came by and we were talking and he, we, you know, we somehow got into Krishna West a little bit. And he started telling me very confidently that, you know, that a dhoti is very superior to, to pants. And the reason he said is that if you, if you, I swear to God, he, he gave this argument. 
and this is like a learned, prominent sannyasi preacher, that um, if you wear a dhoti, you clean it every day, you wash it every day. If you wear pants, you, you don't clean them. And therefore they're superior. And, and, and so there is ISKCON, not everyone, not everyone, not everywhere, but there is a huge amount of Indian chauvinism. And so within ISKCON, it really is there. And again, it's not everyone, it's not everywhere, but it's definitely there in 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 in, in just in the in, in in the blood system of ISKCON. And and I got again, I was flooded with reports from people. Thank God, thank God that, you know, because and they told these horror stories of how they were treated simply because so again, maybe my you know, maybe what I should have done or didn't do was to lift the discourse to a different level, but but I kind of met it where it was. And then the last thing is that um, I would agree, I, let me say this, I would agree with, I, I would accept as an ethical principle, I really stop with this, I accept as a valid ethical principle that if I want to promote certain kinds of what I see as very needed, desperately needed changes in this country, that I should do so in a way which is as, which is the least disturbing possible. I would accept that as an ethical requirement. That it's like you go to the dentist. Let's say you know the dentist has to do something, take you know, with your teeth, but you expect the dentist to do it in the least painful, least intrusive, least uh, disturbing way possible. So I accept that as a valid moral principle. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that every endeavor has some fault. But he says you can't. And so it would be absurd for me to say that I did this perfectly, that I didn't make mistakes. It would be absurd to say that. I mean, of course I did. And if I could do it again, of course I would do it differently. But um, but the fact is that ultimately, let's say, Given that, of course, I, I did some things and, you know, I made some mistakes or I could have done some things in a nicer way, a better way. Taking that as, as an obvious fact. To me, the real question, though, is I still tend to think and maybe, you know, five years now I'll mature even more and I won't think this way. But I but I, but I still tend to think that generally what I did, the fact that I was polemical, the fact that I was a little bold and so on, not, I tend to think that something very different, like just being nice, being more intellectual, just talking, just finding a center, you know, sort of a, a synthetic language in the sense of brings together. I tend to think that given the nature of this world, given the reality of, of socio-psychological principles that it would not have been possible to provide shelter and relief to the thousands and thousands of people who found it. Because one thing I should mention based on the podcast, I just heard a few things on the podcast, but the other one that, uh, that I have had a policy uh, forever. I mean, in Krishna West that we don't actually, I mean, uh, how should I put publicize how successful we actually are because for the simple reason that I, I don't want people attacking us. And so Krishna West is actually very successful and, and not only in the sense of establishing our little centers, which are little, but in the sense of getting thousands and tens of thousands of devotees, especially in the West to really, you know, identify with it. And, um, for example, uh, I've gotten so many letters from people, I mean, almost daily, who came back to ISKCON because of this preaching. I, I Again, I'm not saying my presentation was perfect. It obviously was imperfect, and, and, I, and, I, and I would do it differently. And, and, and so, but just in terms of, of the reality of sociological reality, yeah. how societies function, I believe that a certain degree of, 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 I don't know, sort of like polemics, a certain degree of, a certain degree of generalization and of strong language. Maraj, no arguments. I'm, I'm not, 
um, again, I, I kind of feel like I almost have to like explain, that, like I'm not one of those people that that doesn't like your polemics. I'm actually one of those people that grew up, you know, back in the day. I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit, but like the little 90 minute and 60 minute cassette, <laughs> listening to and learning from um, your polemics. Um, I didn't always agree. I don't still, as as you can tell, right? We have, but always found it thought-provoking, inspiring. I was always grateful and continue to be grateful. So by no means am I saying like, hey, be less polemical and like nicer about, right? It's, it's more for me, um, when you talk about meeting the discourse where it was, for instance, um, and I, and I, and I want to like name how much I appreciate you being open to the possibility that you might've done things differently. I, I, I can understand and sympathize with meeting the discourse where it was. I can also sympathize with have, having to carry this burden of being attacked and critiqued and criticized and sabotaged. And that wears on everyone, even, even superheroes and Prabhupada disciples, um, which in ISKCON sometimes is taken to be the same thing. Right? <laughs> so I can, I can sympathize with that. And at the same time, I wouldn't be um, your pain in the ass nephew <laughs> if I didn't say, Maharaj, I really wish you had not only met the discourse where it was, but that you had, and, 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 and maybe I'll put this in the present tense, my wish for you, for Krishna West, for all of us, is to maybe meet the discourse where it is, but to problematize that discourse, just as you're so brilliantly problematizing everything else. There's so many people <laughs> Islam, that can do that the way you can do that. You have a gift. I'm not trying to flatter you. I'm just stating what I take to be a fact. You, Krishna has blessed you with a certain type of buddhi, a certain type of nature. Um, and where I feel, and I, I'm going to use this word again, where I feel a little bit disappointed with all due respect and love, um, where I feel a little disappointed is like, hey, you do have the opportunity. You do have the power, the privilege, and the position. Yes, you are, you know, you have a, a, a bullseye on, on your back um, in, in certain respects, but you also have way more position and power and privilege than practically than the, the rest of the three of us and practically everyone else listening in. Um, I would love to see you, Maraj, taking the discourse, elevating the discourse, problematizing the discourse, saying, hey, you know, it's it was helpful for a hot second to frame things in <laughs> Indian and 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 Western, but also like that's that can become a, a like a, a you know an easy out dichotomy also. You know, you mentioned chauvinism a couple of times, and I'm glad you did because I um, recently heard a lecture of yours called, um, I, I believe it was called The Culture of Chauvinism. Um, you gave it in, in, in Germany. Uh, and, and I wanted to share with you, Maraj, how much I appreciated, particularly the, the beginning of that lecture, right? I don't know, that's a, that's a real backhanded compliment, right? I, I appreciated the beginning of your lecture. <laughs> Uh, then it all got no. Um, but but in all seriousness, even the idea of calling out a culture of chauvinism, and for those who may not be so familiar with it, and, and you know, I don't want to like, I, I can't do it justice. I don't want to steal your thunder. But at least as I heard it, it was really calling out that in our tradition, um, there is this kind of tendency towards hierarchy and towards dualistic thinking and towards us against them and superiority and inferiority. And then there's another paradigm, which, for instance, in the Gita, which is a text that both of us, I think, very much are informed by, even in our own personal work. Um, in the Gita, and you, you say this brilliantly, there is again and again and again stressed this alternative paradigm of samadarshinaha, of radical empathy, of radical oneness. Um, and although we are not Advaitins, we also have a, our own take. Um, on oneness, and that is also like our cultural jewel. If we want to use cultural, right? We have a, we could have a culture of oneness, and you brilliantly demonstrate in that in that talk, Maharaj. And I'm so grateful to you, you know, to to, to give to, to have given that talk. That historically, for various reasons, we have overemphasized the culture of hierarchy, the culture of dualism, the culture of of chauvinism. I love that. And then when the, when the conversation turned to talk about that culture of chauvinism in terms of Indian chauvinism and Western something else, 
to me, again, that was a missed opportunity or that is a missed opportunity to say, let's do the hard work of uprooting a culture of chauvinism at its deepest level. It may show up symptomatically as a certain, I'm not even gonna like, I mean, I don't wanna speak for anyone else, but at least in my experience, it's a very kind of superficial, selective, even appropriative, right? We wanna talk about like cultural appropriation as like a hot button issue. I find it very appropriative, very selective, um, very self-serving, counterfeit version of, of, of Indian culture that is then given this mythic standard, this this mythic you know status, and is used as a weapon against folks like yourself and Krishna West. Let's dig deeper. What's going on? What what is what is enabling that kind of stuff to happen in the first place? What is the what is the 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 the, the culture of um, you know us against them as you laid out? What is the culture of fanaticism and dogmatism? What is the culture of and I, I'm I'm sorry to like to 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 now like you know maybe um, get the attention of and ruffle the feathers of of maybe the, the folks who are hanging out very much in the east quadrant, um, <laughs> if, if we're or, you know if we're on the far right or whatever. But um, what is the what is the culture of literalism that we have practically made a sacred cow in Iskon today? that enables and undergirds all this other stuff that shows up as someone bullying your, you know, your, your friends who wrote to you um, because they didn't want to wear a dhoti and they, they felt more comfortable wearing pants or a skirt, right? Can we have a conversation about that? Can we have a conversation about the racism, the sexism, the misogyny, the homophobia, all of that that is really keeping us from being relevant and attractive to people? And that even if we are somehow are able by hook or by crook and a lot of crook in that, if we're able to somehow or other get someone um, into our into our myths, we do a, a terrible job of keeping them there, right? So retention. So you're saying you're saying that we should have more of the deeper conversation rather than the doti, the doti yeah, sorry conversation. My whole point about the Malibu Stacy doll with the hat. It's not that I'm anti hat, Maraj. You've met a bunch of people that somehow or other are really threatened by hats and have have like given you the anti-hat piece of this. I'm not one of those people. I'm not anti-hat. I by anti-hat, what do you mean? Because people, some people may have not watched the previous episode. So. I don't know it myself. Okay, it, the analogy I gave was of a talking doll and the problem is what the, what the, what the doll says and the, the way that the manufacturers of the doll try to pull the wool over people's eyes is by putting a hat on it and marketing it as a whole new doll. Okay. And, um, that, and that is synonymous with what? And that is synonymous with, or that is what I'm, I'm equating with. If we stay surface level, then a lot of those same dysfunctions go on under the surface, but we all pat ourselves on the back. I'm not saying you're doing this Maraj, but, but th there's a tendency that we can pat ourselves on the back and say problem solved because we switched out the hat or we switched out, you know, <laughs> skirt for pants or pants for skirt. Yeah. But we're not dealing with the underlying dysfunction. We're not dealing with what it is that actually is manifesting as this rigid adherence to certain things and 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 holding certain things in ISKCON sacrosanct because that's the way we've always done it and even elevating those things somehow. Yeah, I, I would I would uh I think I like what you're saying, and I um, generally agree with you. By the way, the Spanish speakers have given up on me, I think, because I can't. <laughs> yeah, for my sure. My apologies to them. But, espero uh, que no, espero que, que sigan traduciendo. I hope they keep translating. Yeah, I, I mean, generally, I agree with you. And and I think and I, I welcome your call, which you've made uh, several times in our talk, to look at some of the deeper, perhaps you could say psychological or socio-psychological aspects, like what's really going on. I, I think that's very good. And at the same time, I mean, in a complimentary vein, not like, no, not that, not what you said, this instead, but rather as a compliment, complimentary that Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics, his famous book on ethics, uh, he writes that, uh, one becomes virtuous by practicing virtue, sort of sadhana virtue, 
it, it's like if you when you're tra- raising your children if you you know teach them to have manners you t- treat them you train them that you know you have to talk to people in a respectful way and so on and then by doing that they it, it actually inculcates a certain type of desirable behavior so I, I agree with you I think the discussion you're calling for would be very valuable and so I think it's an excellent idea at the same time I think that sort of insisting that people be treated properly uh, is part of it. Because I think a lot of the people who are, let's say, were perpetrators of a type of, let's say, you know, not treating other people generously, uh, they may be the last people to become, to sign up for a course on the psychology of chauvinism or something. And so, and so I think, I think, I think there are parallel tracks. One is to, and I welcome that discussion. I'm glad you, you know, you've been mentioning that many times. And I think it's, an, it's a great idea. And that discussion should take place. At the same time, I think certain types of behavior should be, if I dare to say it, uh, stigmatized, such as, such as just mistreating people, not treating people well. And so I, I think both of those have a, have a place. Can we stigmatize the, the the what is truly dis, the dysfunctional behavior without symptom without stigmatizing the cultural trappings that happen to go along with it in this example? Uh, yeah, of course. Because like in that, I, I, I think I I I mean if if it were the case that significant numbers of leaders or just devotees were so, how should I put it, um, appreciative of abstract philosophical and psychological principles that if you just teach them these general principles, they will then conscientiously apply them in their lives and do the right thing. Uh, but, but I think that um, my experience of humanity even that portion of it that joined the Hare Krishna movement is that um, I think I think both are needed. I, I think for people who truly value truth and philosophy and learning and people who are more verminical, I think, yes, you know, talking about maybe you could sometimes give an example of, for example, chauvinism can manifest in this way or that way but not really centering the discourse on the types of specific concrete issues that I've tended to center on. Um, I think, yeah, that would be fa- that would be very interesting and, and, and effective for a certain class of people. But I don't think, I, I mean, even, yeah, I, I, I think there does have to be a call for more generous and, and open-minded behavior I, I agree with you, Maraj. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't think that what I'm what I'm suggesting, as far as um, this sort of deeper conversation, necessarily needs to be abstract. I mean, I think it it may involve some larger kind of you know um, more universal principles um, like humility or like. Um, oneness, as you as you brought up, or harmonizing, or appreciation of the other, right? I, one of the points I really I, I really um, felt inspired by was your um, encouraging us to appreciate what is what what should be appreciated, um, whether it shows up in an Indian context or Western context. Right? There's great achievements with, within European various European cultures, for instance, that like we don't lose anything by appreciating and giving credit where credit is due. So I, I do think that that you know, while these things may seem abstract, there are ways to put them into concrete practice. Um, when it comes to when it comes to sort of this back to this existential crisis, which is a, a concrete crisis that we're feeling, right? We're talking about within you know within your lifetime, within my lifetime. Um, we're talking about we're talking about a, a very sort of real, like, I'm, I'm not, you know, we can parse out how much, I, I, how comfortable I am with the, the statement, it's all about numbers, but the numbers are part of it for sure. Um, I, I, I don't wanna disagree with that. So I recognize there's a concrete reality to it. 
at the same time, can we move the discourse, even in terms of concrete reality, more and more to a place of genuine diversity? Like I, I work on a college campus. You're very, very much in, in the academic world. I don't know if you're teaching right now, um, but, but it's a world that you're familiar with. Brahmachir the Prabhu, you're very familiar with that world, Nam. What is what is being stressed beyond anything else practically in places like institutions of higher, you know, of, of higher education, in other thoughtful spaces? What is being stressed is diversity, is inclusion, is equity. I think we can have the con kind of conversations that I'm I'm talking about and and take those conversations to very concrete places, concrete places that are rooted in a commitment to diversity. So being committed to say, hey, if there are monochromatic or if there are homogenous temples and centers and pockets, whatever of, 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 of whatever race or ethnicity, that's not really living up to, to Prabhupada's potential. That's not really living up to ISKCON's potential. There may be reasons for it. We don't need to beat anyone up over it, but that's not really what Prabhupada envisioned. That's not really what Bhaktivinoda Thakur envisioned in this beautiful you know, um, language of having the Russians and the Prussians and other words that rhyme with Russians and Prussians together, you know, linking arms. That's a vision of radical diversity to me. That's a vision of, of, of radical inclusivity to me. Um, that's our tradition as far as, as far as I understand and appreciate it. Oh yeah, but, the, but there's- Let's take concrete steps to do that. Let's yeah. do that in the Western world. Okay, but, I, but here's one, okay, a few points. Just Mar Maraj, before you get there, can I just add one, one sure. more thing? Sure. 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 I think it is, it's important to give the whole picture. What I'm saying is in the West, particularly in a place like North America, which is, it, which is almost practically speaking by definition, multicultural. In the Western world today, our temples, our centers, here's the challenge that I'm, that I'm issuing. Okay, this is like a public setting. So whatever, I'm gonna piss people off, but here's a challenge that, that I'm gonna put out there. An ISKCON or Krishna conscious center or project should be at least, should reflect at the very bare minimum, at least should reflect the diversity of its locality. Okay. And, and I, but the real challenge is, I think we can do better than just reflecting that. I think what the challenge is every ISKCON temple center project should not just reflect the diversity, but actually should be a paragon, an exemplar of real diversity, real inclusivity, real equity, on the high, built on the highest principles and doing it in the most exemplary way. People, I, I would love to see people leaving an ISKCON project or a Krishna conscious project saying, hey, I'm not exactly sure if I 100% agree with this point philosophically or if I'm bought into this idea of Krishna as a supreme personality of Godhead or whatever, whatever, whatever. But one thing I cannot fault these people with is they walk their talk as far as spiritual oneness, as far as embracing diversity, as far as living out that culture. Yeah. Okay, I got, I appreciate, yeah, there's a few, very interesting topic. I'm gonna jump in here and uh, just as you risk being politically incorrect, I will now, you know, risk it. But one thing I should say is that a lot of this, the, the, the type of, let's say, strong speech that, 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 you know, that some people feel should be more moderate, a lot of that is kind of, I don't wanna say ancient history, but it's just kind of in the past. I mean, for example, we 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 have a Krishna West Council. It's kind of like our little governing body, which is international and diverse. And um, and um, they're actually much nicer than me. Uh, they're actually much nicer than me. And this, I mean, they're really not radical. They don't they don't even talk about these things. I mean, there was a time when I was it's kind of like you know you had sort of like break the wall down. And and Brahmacharya actually after Jane after I got back in the JVC Brahmacharya said these few simple words that really I, I felt came from Krishna, and he said the war is over. And so I would say if, if you look at Krishna West projects where they're flourishing in different countries and everything, devotees really, they don't really talk about these things anymore. They don't you know all these things about dotis and saris. That, that's kind of like that was a certain stage in the dialectic, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. In a sense, you're calling for a dialectical synthesis. And and I think we're actually kind of there. So so the actual leaders of Krishna West, I mean, not people that just 
you know, flame on online or something. But the actual leaders, the official leaders of Krishna West are actually very moderate. They're very, they don't really attack anyone. And they don't, this is not really like the discourse we're talking about that was a little radical. It's really not even the discourse anymore of Krishna West. It was like, if you look at most of the lectures where I talk about that, they're from, you know, several years ago. So that's uh, one thing. Yeah. So, just, just to finish this, just a few points I have to get out and, and then Brahmacharya can speak. And that is, um, as far as you mentioned about, about the sadhu, you know, a place for the sadhu. I actually said there's a place for the lone sadhu. And um, in the sense that, take someone like Radhana Swami, who, who's, you know, obviously an excellent devotee. And uh, nothing could be more authentic than Radhana Swami dressed like an Indian sadhu. I mean, it's 100% authentic. He obviously was a sadhu who somehow took birth in the Chicago area. And so, and, and he's welcomed everywhere he go. I mean, people appreciate him, the media, everywhere he goes. But I'm saying it's the lone sadhu. It, it's like the Dalai Lama, you know, the darling of, of the West. But if there, let's say there were like a hundred Dalai Lama followers, Western people all dressed like him, that would have a different reaction. But but I really, but then the last thing I want to say, and then Brahmacharya wants to speak, and that is about diversity. First of all, uh, I mean, obviously diversity. I mean, I've preached all around the world. I've preached to people of every you know possible race and ethnicity, and, and I was very happy to do it, and I continue to do it. So obviously we're not the body. That's our whole thing. You're not the body. We're all souls. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your race. I mean, if we don't get that, we haven't understood anything. At the same time, I think that the diversity which is being pushed by the left is very hypocritical, especially by the academic left. I think it's very hypocritical. It's been noted by many uh, educational leaders, including presidents of the you know, most prestigious universities in the country, that the hypocritical call for diversity, because it's not viewpoint diversity, it's just like, so, so you can have, let's say, uh, on, on an Ivy League campus, a black student and a white student who both are privileged, both went to the best schools, and, and, and both, you know, agree on everything politically. So, so viewpoint diversity has actually been persecuted. It has been, uh, you know, purged. So if you look, for example, at the, um, and they study these things, at the, the, let's say percentages on, on in humanities faculties, percentages of professors who lean left, percentage that leans right. Let's say back when I went to college, when there was all the revolution in the late 60s, it was about two to one, like left over right. Maybe, for, you know, two liberal professors to a conservative professor. Now it's something like 32 to one. And, and, and so, I mean, this whole thing was, you know, the, the, the medicalizing, the fact that if it, it's actually a medical threat to you on the campus, if someone disagrees with you, you need safe spaces and trigger warnings. And, and this is, I mean, this is, this is really all over the internet in terms of social scientists and, and educational leaders, I mean, criticizing this, thinking it's, you know, it's absurd. So the kind of diversity that they call for it's almost like if you get let's say you get a community like 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 a chicano community they're just getting together for something yeah that's what they do they get together or a filipino community or an african-american community or a um or anything or an indian community i mean you know they tend to live in neighborhoods together it's always been that way people feel comfortable with people like them and yet in the West, if you're a white person and you feel comfortable with white people, you're racist. You're, I mean, every other conceivable racial and ethnic group can feel comfortable with people who are kind of like them and share certain things, except one group that they do it, they're evil. And so I'm not justifying racism or anything like that. Or, but so, so I think that when you said diversity, I mean, you're, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you. And if ISKCON is, I mean, international society, international means diverse. It means diverse. And, and we're, we're supposed to be the people that don't identify with the body. So I can, I 100% agree with you. It's just that I think the way that, and, and like you mentioned appropriation, like, like culture appropriation, I think there's one probably should get a gold medal from one of the most idiotic ideas in, in, in the history of, of the Western world. But 
and anyway, I won't go into that, but there's a lot of good arguments to, behind what I'm saying. But three more podcasts. Yes. I mean, we're but, we're coming up to two hours now. Okay, and, so and, I'll just end with this sentence. So I agree with you 100% about we are the international, you're not your body, Society for Krishna Consciousness. And we should show that. At the same time, I just don't want to get sucked into what I find to be the extremely hypocritical and historically ignorant way that some of these words are used uh, by the political left. Pramatirtha Prabhu, did you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, um, the key principle is samadarshana. And as and and uh, Prabhupada was very concerned um, uh, that we have that uh, that equal vision. We're seeing yeah, somebody's Westerner, Indian, Russian, man, woman. We really uh, have to see the unity beyond the diversity. And that's what makes Iskon temples work well. Prabhupada was so pleased when Bhaktivinoda Thakur's prediction of all the different uh, uh, ethnicities dancing together in Mayapur. He made the prediction 100 years later it happened. And, and so uh, there is a natural diversity out there. I, I mean, people of the same ethnicity or people from the same city I mean, if I meet someone from my city in New Jersey, I'm going to sit with them at a Sunday feast, obviously. Talk to them. We're all going to do that. But that's always secondary to the principle, the higher principle. And ISKCON works well when the higher principles in place. Take it with the topic that brought this discussion, the Indian community. Natch is going to be a topic because there's such a large Indian community that's part of ISKCON. But the important thing with the Indian community is they're not Indian. I'm not American. That we're working together to please Prabhupada. And the cultural trappings that every one of our communities is going to have. I'm from a Jewish New Jersey community. I have certain cultural trappings. We all do. And and, and no denying them. And, uh, and um, we can be comfortable in that skin, knowing that is only our skin. And what really counts is a spiritual oneness. And one of the biggest dangers in this gun, and Venkata has really pointed this out, um, is to start dividing the world up Indian American. And uh, we see in Iskan India, uh, sometimes that can be that the, there, um, we can see some racial lines get drawn. We can see in South Africa, ISKCON, sometimes racial lines get drawn. And we see it in other places. And when racial lines get drawn in ISKCON or ethnic lines get drawn, then we are absolutely, totally missing the point of what is the unity behind the diversity. Uh, again, we can't deny some diversity. It's just natural. But it's the unity is the overriding principle. And the diversity um, to me, is the detail. So I think, Venkata, you made a, a very important point that we not get distracted by too much distinction from between, let's say, Indian and Western was the distinct was the seminal distinction that began that uh, began this podcast. Uh, also, I think, uh, Rita Maj, you're making the point that. Um, we still have to be observant to who our audience is, what our mission is, and are we accomplishing it? In other words, are we getting too wrapped up in a particular um, uh, uh, ethnic identity such that we lose our mission? I don't. I, there has to be a middle road balance here. People are always going to identify somewhat ethnically it's just it's just the way the world is and 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing the bad thing is when it becomes uh, a source of um, division within the society not only is it a bad thing it's the worst thing it's terrible and i think venkata you're trying to appeal let's not go down that road and i think marge is is going to is, is trying to go down the road I think saying the same thing, let's not go down that road either. Because if, if we make it an Indian culture, then 
what have we gained? And if we're distinguishing between Indians and, um, and let's say Americans in this case, too much, and we're making some distinctions here, uh, Venkata, you're saying, well, we're again going to miss Samadarshana. So to me, Samadarshana is the key for our success. Well, uh, look on here. We, we have, you know, we are, the four of us, a diverse group. We have an East Coaster, a West Coaster. We have two people of Indian extraction. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that makes ISKCON work. And I've had many experiences of, um, let's say, I, I hang out with a lot of uh, professors from my SEVA, and they are always impressed about the diversity. We put on a major science conference a year and a half ago, and the diversity, uh, we had like five continents there. And that, that I've received several comments how wonderful that diversity was and we could all work together. That, and you made this point, Venkata, is what really impresses the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that was like my to, sermon for the day. Thank you, thank you, Prabhu. So we, we're going past two hours now. So I'd just like to end here. Uh, I, we can do a continuation. We'll talk about it offline, but I'd like to end with a um, short uh, you know, ending statement from you all. So, um, uh, Maharaj, please, please give us your concluding statement. Uh, thank you. Well, it was a lot of fun to see Venkat again, speak with him, and of course to meet you and uh, that Brahmacharya. Anyway, my old friend Brahmacharya. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would say that. I would say on the fundamentals, we agree. I don't think we have any fundamental disagreement. Uh, and I think to me, I take it as an arrangement by, of Krishna that we had this conversation. And the idea that, I mean, in fact, it, Krishna West right now really is not so polemical. It's really not very polemical at all. It's we're just positively pursuing programs and welcome everybody. And the polemical stuff was, most of it was, you know, from a few to several years ago. Even even the talk that you quoted, like the one in Germany, that was several years ago. And so we're really not, we're not in that stage now of arguing with this con. We made our point. And so I would say in practice, we're, we look like what I think what Venkata would like us to look like. And we're just positively trying to bring people to Krishna. And I want to put out a call if anyone out there with any kind of body, you know, male, female, <laughs> you know, Indian, Western, you are most welcome. There's absolutely no racial requirement or ethnic requirement. I mean, we're trying to reach Western people. If you have a good way to do it, please help us. You're most welcome. And uh, and thank you, uh, Namrasa, for this opportunity to uh, to explain ourselves. It, it was deeply an honor, Maraj. You know, I, I grew up watching your your debate with Ted Patrick, and I, it was uh, I was just such a big fan. Uh, uh, Venkata, Venkata, yeah. be like in Ted Patrick's seat. <laughs> <laughs> Venkata, Venkata, go ahead with your concluding statement, please. Well, likewise, Maraj, this was a, a pleasure and an honor, and um, I, yeah, I just, I mean, I, I think we could have gone on much longer, um, and, and hopefully, those conversations will go on. Um, you mentioned earlier um, having this kind of Kshatriya tendency, and and I've been told, I don't know how accurate it is in my own case, but I've been told that about myself sometimes. Um, and um, so I think there's some resonance there, and I think also, you know, things get feisty and fiery, and, um, and, and good things can come of that, uh, although I appreciate the need to engage that rajas creatively and then also situate ourselves in sattva, and hopefully we're on our way to to doing that. Um, but using the Kshatriya kind of imagery, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, and, and again, I've, I've said it before, I just want to reiterate how much I, I really do from, from my heart appreciate the boldness and the, the innovativeness and mm -hmm. the, the courage, frankly, um, especially knowing a little bit more of the history now, I can use that word even more um, purposefully the courage that it takes to to kind of you know to put yourself out there on a limb and to make this call and um i honor that intention i feel like 
you know, I, I still have some processing to do as far as how that has impacted folks and continues to impact folks. And I'm hopeful after this conversation, but I, but I think there is still more work to be done. Um, but in that spirit of, of Kshatriya is like, I would, I would love for us to be in a place, Maharaj, where, um, where we, where we were so much on the same page as to the work that needs to be done that in, in my own small way, if I could help like raise up an army for you, like, oh my gosh, I may not be like a, a general, but like, if I could help raise up an army for you there, there, I just want to let you know, there are countless, countless, um, whether they're Indian Americans, whether they're, they're again, people of, of, of various mixed race, mixed ethnicities, third culture kids, guru coolies, you know, all sorts of, of, of folks that, that um, I think would really love to be part of a progressive way forward if they felt, and if, and I'll use myself, if we felt like we could do that in a way that we were committed to um, not recreating problematic dichotomies, but, but to truly moving past them. And I hope this conversation is a start to get us there. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Brahmachirtha Prabhu, please. Um, um, I, I think that um, uh, Venkata's uh, point is really appreciated because Venkata, I think you have helped um, uh, Krishna West folks understand things. Sometimes somebody has to tell us what we look like. You know, we never want to be the emperor without any clothes. And that's always a danger in, in our society. Um, I, um, after the Ujjain meeting, and I was there, and there were 13 GBCs basically um, wondering what Haridhanaj was up to, and it started off very rough. It ended so pleasant that one of his biggest opponents nominated him to be on the GBC again, and another major uh, opposition uh, uh, a GBC and guru in Europe uh, said to me afterwards, can he open a center in the capital of my country? Wow. Uh, we, 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 no, no, in other words, there was some unity there because we really did what Nam Rasa wanted done now. We really talked out the issues and, and broke past polemics into what are we really saying and what is the unity involved. Turns out the unity was far, far beyond the diversity and the results were good. So what you're doing, Nam Rasa, uh, is here is trying to get a platform where we can really understand each other. Now, sure. you might have seen me looking away while we're talking because there are hundreds and hundreds of comments coming in, and they're mm -hmm. coming in faster than I can read them. So, uh, again, a compliment to you. Um, your show obviously has a lot of listeners, and we've expanded it with Maharaj's audience. Yes. Uh, second, uh, for the most part, with a few exceptions, a lot of really nice questions, a few polemics that aren't necessary there, but almost all of it. There's so many good questions there that we didn't get to. Yeah. So that means everyone who are involved in this and listened for two hours, they deserve some answers. So I leave it to you, Nam Rasa, to figure out what that might look like down the road. But yeah. um, uh, they're also part of this dialogue. And uh, um, definitely, I think we could have a nice uh, Q and A session in which the answers are limited to uh, short answers. Sure, and, I, and, I, and that might be very effective for just getting through a long list and people, because what most of us can kind of deal with hypotheticals, but when we get down to the practical reality, it helps it sink in, and a lot right. of the questions come down to yeah that. i mean the good thing thank you Prabhu. the good thing about these comments uh that are coming in is that they'll be there at, even after this whole thing is over uh so so um i i encourage everyone to uh you know reply and comment and whatnot so uh yeah i mean i i uh, this is the end and i really appreciate uh all you devotees coming on especially maharaj mm -hmm. and especially brahmajitha prabhu venkatabad is my brother-in-law so he kind of like goes along with these things that i'm trying to do but uh i'd I'll, i'd just like to say i'm really honored that we had such a really deep and respectful conversation and i think it was really uh really nice um another thing is that 
uh, maybe we you can we can take you up on your idea, Brahmachutra Prabhu, to have a follow up or a question and answer session or whatever it's going to be. Uh, but with that, I, I I say thank you again for all our listeners. Uh, please um, subscribe to my YouTube channel and to my Facebook, uh, you know, my Facebook page, uh, the Late Morning Program with Namras. And uh, again, I I just appreciate everyone for coming on. Thank you so much, everyone. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you. Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.